Good morning. Um, I'm afraid I woke up with laryngitis this morning, so, but the, that's the bad news. The good news, I'll be off the podium in five minutes. Welcome to CSIS and to our preliminary reassessment of Al-Qaeda revisited a decade after 9-11. My name is Arno de Borgraf, for those of you who don't know me, and I direct the Transnational Threats Project at CSIS. Well, while all eyes and ears are on Egypt, the most dangerous country in the world, let me remind you, is still Pakistan, home to more terrorist organizations than any other country. On every issue that matters to us, Pakistan in the 21st century will be crucial. Nuclear proliferation, nuclear war, transnational terrorism, the future of jihad, the future of democracy in the Islamic world. Pakistan, both victim and sponsor of Taliban terrorism, and the recurring nightmare of Pakistan as a jihadist state with nukes also a country where 64% of the people still consider the U.S. as the enemy. As a foreign correspondent, I covered every war in the subcontinent since China invaded India in 1962, and every war in the Middle East since the invasion of Suez by the U.K., France, and Israel in 1956. Now Egypt, as you can see, is back in the mix with the renewed threat of the Muslim Brotherhood, whose five guiding principles have been subsumed in its good neighborly political camouflage. And they are, one, Allah is our objective, two, the Prophet is our leader, three, the Quran is our law, four, Jihad is our way, five, dying in the way of Allah is our highest hope. Osama bin Laden's number two, as you know, Iman al-Zawahiri, came out of the Brotherhood. The way we've been pushing Mubarak to resign before a proper successor process is in place, in my judgment, simply empowers Islamic radicals, and Egypt has lots of them. My first encounter with the Brotherhood occurred in Cairo, January 26, 1952. Sixty years ago, I had arrived in Cairo the day before on assignment for Newsweek. Ned Calm of CBS and I were the only two U.S. journalists in town to witness the torching of some 300 buildings and businesses in Cairo, including the Shepherd's Hotel where we were staying. Thus ended the only six years of democracy that Egypt has known in 5,000 years of history. Gamal Abdel Nasser staged a bloodless coup six months later, whose main purpose was not the overthrow of the monarchy, which was a side order bonus, but to block the Muslim Brotherhood from undermining the system with a view to taking over. The Brotherhood's assassination attempt against Nasser failed two months later, but the one against Sadat, 20 years later, succeeded. Now officially banned, it has resurfaced under the, a different name and with a considerably diluted agenda. The new Vice President Omar Suleiman, head of intelligence for almost two decades, invited the Brotherhood leaders, as you saw on television a couple of days ago, to a meeting that he chaired with other political leaders, but no sooner back on the street than they denounced reconciliation. The Brotherhood, let me remind you, is also close partner with Hamas and Hezbollah. British uh, uh, PM uh, David Cameron used the Egyptian crisis to remind Europe to stamp out intolerance of Western values within its own Muslim communities as well as the provocations of far-right groups. We won't defeat terrorism simply by the actions we take outside our borders, said Cameron. Europe needs to wake up to what's happening in our own countries. Several terrorist attacks uh, or several terrorists involved in attacks or attempted plots uh, in the U.S., Sweden, Denmark, and Norway over the last two years had links to British-based clerics. Well, enough about uh, what we're going to be talking about this morning. Let me remind you that General de Gaulle once said that uh, the graveyards of the world are full of indispensable people, but I make an exception today for our first speaker. Uh, <laughs> such, an accept <laughs> such an exception, as you've guessed, is Juan Zarate, a senior advisor at CSIS and the senior national security consultant and analyst at CBS News. He's also an ambulatory encyclopedia on transnational terrorism. Juan Zarate served as the Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy National Security Advisors for Counterterrorism for five critical years through 2009. Prior to joining the National Security Council, he served as the first Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Terrorist Funding and Financial Crimes, where he became 007 for domestic and international efforts to, oh, some people are still following me. Yeah, <laughs> to attack terrorist financing, build comprehensively anti-money laundering systems, and expand the use of Treasury's powers to advance national security interests. One also served as prosecutor at the Justice Department's Terrorism and Violent Crime Section, where he worked on the USS Cole investigation, or the Al-Qaeda attack on the USS Cole, October 12, 
2000, which killed not only 17 U.S. sailors and wounded 39 and immobilized a billion dollar warship for two years with a repair bill of $250 million, all at a cost of $10,000 for Al-Qaeda. So I give you one Zaradi. Now you know in part why I love Arno. Uh, Arno, thank you for the very kind introduction, and I, I will tell you it is uh, an honor for me to, to be here and associated as a senior advisor to CSIS, in large part because I get to learn and work with Arno, uh, not only a legendary journalist, but uh, a, a continuing groundbreaker uh, in terms of the threats that we face uh, today. And so I'm honored to be a part of this organization uh, because Arno is. Um, I want to thank you all for coming today. I think uh, today for us is an important launch not just of this report, but uh, making public a project that has been underway for some months now, and it's part of a year-long project to look at the future of al-Qaeda and associated movements. Uh, this is an important report, I think, at a critical time. Uh, we had Director Leiter of the National Counterterrorism Center speaking to CSIS last year, uh, where he said, uh, at no period since 9-11 has there been a more complicated threat environment that we've seen. And I think he's absolutely right. I've talked about a terrorist hydra led by al-Qaeda that we are seeing, which has evolved over time and which is often both misunderstood and uh, misspoken about. And I think one of the things that this report does, entitled The Threat Transformed Al-Qaeda and Associated Movements in 2011, is to give uh, granularity and rigor uh, to what is now a very different threat than what we saw post 9-11. Uh, the report talks about three tiers of the threat. Uh, I think for those who follow these issues, uh, the, the categorization will not be new. Understanding the al-Qaeda core, the traditional bin Laden, Zawahiri led core, then the al-Qaeda affiliates and like-minded groups, finally the al-Qaeda inspired but non-affiliated cells and in individuals. And the report gives rigor uh, to the methodology to look at all three as component parts of a cohesive whole. Looking then at the ideological ligament that ties all of this together with the common narrative uh, that draws them uh, together. For the policy community, and I can speak to you as uh, someone who uh, suffered through uh, policy making and often what I call policy thrashing from threat to threat, from incident to incident, uh, from um, uh, reactionary policy to reactionary policy, uh, this kind of a study is important for policymakers. I think in part because it helps define not only the lexicon and how we talk about the threat. Uh, you've heard the administration talk more and more about the syndicate of terror, and I think this report talks to exactly the lexicon. But it also helps shape policies that are forward-looking, that don't rely on uh, post-9-11 paradigms that may not be applicable. And I think this report and the project that we're undertaking also helps understand the dynamics of a very different global environment. I think we're seeing much of that in Egypt today, the role of social networking, uh, the internet, uh, what I would call Al-Qaeda 2.0, and understanding what, how those dynamics not only are affected, but can be affected. Uh, for those of you who have a report before you, you know that there are three sections to the report. The first section discusses the evolution of Al-Qaeda core, the organization led by bin Laden, beginning in the 1990s. Section two talks about the rise of al-Qaeda affiliates and non-affiliated cells and individuals. And then section three examines al-Qaeda and associated movements and the threat they face, we face today from them. I think the bottom line in terms of the report is that we are face, facing a changed enemy, a changed environment. Uh, an al-Qaeda that's been affected by the environment, but an al-Qaeda that also leverages and tries to influence the environment. As I mentioned, this report uh, is the first product of several as part of a year-long study that we call the AQAM Futures Project. Uh, this report is the foundation for that. Uh, the purpose of the project uh, is to forecast the nature and evolution of AQAM into 2025. Uh, that is to look at the nature of the movement and the ideology, its potential geographic reach, operational capabilities, how trends and potential shocks may impact it, all with the goal of allowing governments, uh, in particular the United States, to forecast, but also to, to plan policies that will constrain and counteract the evolution of AQAM. Again, an attempt to, to uh, refute the thrashing from threat to threat and the reactive policies that often define 
how the U.S. government reacts in a counterterrorism uh, venue. Finally, um, let me speak a little bit to the products that we intend uh, to produce. The first, obviously, is the report before you. Uh, we intend to have a number of podcasts over the next couple of months, but ultimately we will have a final report released in September of 2011. Uh, we'll release that during a capstone conference examining the evolving threat of AQAM 10 years after 9-11. We've brought together a number of uh, senior counterterrorism experts to help us with this study. We have an excellent research team led by Tom Sanderson and Ozzie Nelson, who are the authors of this report. Uh, but we also have assembled a global network of counterterrorism experts, social scientists, and anthropologists to help us understand what is the potential future trajectory of this movement. Um, I'm honored to lead that group. It's a senior advisory group, which Arno and I oversee, and which is uh, providing oversight and guidance to the overarching study. Uh, this uh, study and this project is sponsored by the Department of Defense and the government of Singapore. They are our primary sponsors. I'd like to thank them today for that sponsorship. Uh, and this will be undertaken, as you know, by the Transnational Threat Project, led by Arnaud de Borsgrave, Deputy Director Thomas Sanderson, and the Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Project and Program, led by Ozzie Nelson. Uh, again, I'm honored to be a part of this project. I think this is incredibly important as we look to the evolution of al-Qaeda, uh, and I'm looking forward to today's events. Uh, we will hear from Tom Sanderson first, and then Ozzie Nelson to describe the report, and then we'll open up the forum to questions, and I will moderate. Thank you again for being here, and I look forward to the session. Thank you, Juan, and thank you, Arno, and thank you, folks, for joining us today. It's great to see so many faces uh, familiar and new uh, for such a timely topic. Obviously, we're several months ahead um, of uh, uh, several months in, in front of the 10-year uh, anniversary here, and uh, we'll be doing quite a bit uh, in the run-up to that. Um, first, I'd like to thank Arno and Juan for their excellent oversight and contributions to the reports, their experience in government and in journalism across 100 countries, in Arno's case, uh, provides incredible uh, input and insight into this, and that's, that's uh, to the benefit of, of Ozzy and myself in, in running this project. Importantly, um, I have to recognize, Ozzy and I have to recognize, we all do, that we are co-authors of this report, including um, three others that need to be recognized, and that's David Gordon, and for, I'm not sure where David is, uh, ben Bodurian and, and Amy Bagia are uh, co-authors in this report that did a tremendous amount of work, and thank you for all of that. We also had an no excellent number of people working on the research team, <coughs> including Mohammed, Zach, Rob, Emily, Sadiqa, Jason, and Jackie. So thank you for that incredible uh, effort that you put into this. Um, let me just uh, start off by first talking a little bit about uh, al-Qaeda uh, today and uh, in its differences a little bit about its history, and then we'll talk about the, uh, the three different levels. And um, I want to point to a few books that have been very helpful to us in doing this. Of course, uh, if you want exhaustive detail on, on what took place, you go to the 9-11 report. It's excellent. The Looming Tower was also a superb resource for us, in addition to the people that we, we um, met with. And, and just by chance today, my good friend sitting in the front row here, Ron Marks, has published a great book that uh, we all look forward to hearing about this afternoon. So well done in that, um, Ron. Al-Qaeda today, as Juan mentioned, poses a far different threat than it did on September 11, 2001. At that time, it was a hierarchical organization composed of Osama bin Laden and his associates which has grown now to include regional terrorist groups, small cells, and of course individuals, which has been a great concern in the United States. Our report terms these Al-Qaeda and associated movements are AQAM. The three basic tiers, as Juan laid out very briefly, include the first tier with bin Laden and his close associates all comprising Al-Qaeda core, the group responsible for 9-11 now based in West Western Pakistan. And while they are protected or at least inaccessible to our forces, they are significantly degraded and restricted in their ability to conduct operations. One of the good things that has certainly come out of our, our 10 years of combating them. <clears throat> Al-Qaeda affiliates and like-minded groups is the broad category that includes groups such as Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula in Yemen, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, Jamaa Islamiya in Indonesia, and several other regional terrorist organizations. And these are groups that have regular contact and af affiliation with al-Qaeda. Then we move to a third tier, al-Qaeda-inspired non-affiliated cells and individuals. This is a diffuse tier comprising of radicalized groups and individuals that are not regularly but infrequently affiliated with 
and draw clear inspiration from and occasional guidance from the core and its affiliates. So it's not just that they're associated with the core, but perhaps with the affiliates themselves. These are the individuals have, who have heard the call to battle, who have plied the internet, who have been approached by radicals and others to join up in, in light of this narrative that the West is at war with Islam, and that is one of the most concerning elements of this. Our report discusses how these groups came about, some of the history, but the main focus is on the contemporary trends and then, of course, in the future of this. So we'll only go into AQ's history just a little bit, which again is detailed significantly in these books and many others. So nine and a half years on from 9-11, it's well known that bin Laden and militants associated with AQAM participated in the resistance movement uh, against the Soviet occupation in the 1980s, something that Arno covered uh, by going to the area and actually interviewing Mujahideen at the time. This experience greatly empowered bin Laden. We know that he and others believe that with the withdrawal in February of 89 of the last Soviet troops and the fall of the Berlin Wall just several months later in November, is something that greatly empowered this group and gave them the sense and the feeling that they could go on and challenge their home countries, the near enemy, and then, of course, challenge the United States, the far enemy. So a very important component, as we all know. But that experience preceded more than a decade's worth of, of uh, alliance building and increasingly lethal terrorist activity for the core, and ultimately culminated in the 9-11 attacks. Some of the most important of those attacks that preceded that, of course, are the 1998 uh, dual bombings in Kenya and Tanzania, which killed, I think, 212 people, and then the 2000 USS coal bombing that Arno detailed just a few moments ago. But of course, the real game changer was the multi-point attack on 9-11. Um, and, uh, and that's, uh, that's our launching point for today. So as the U.S. decimated many of those actors following our October 7, 2001 intervention and uh, assault into Afghanistan, we then saw a rise of a number of regional affiliates. Later in the decade, policymakers grew very concerned, increasingly concerned, as cells and individuals started to spread and pop up that were clearly affiliated, some and others not affiliated, but which drew the inspiration from these groups. This is a deeply disturbing trend. We've seen it for some time now, but this, of course, followed on our focus of a single group now looking at this amalgam of threats. Some of the affiliates that we've mentioned already, Jamaa Islamiyah, known for its bombing of the Bali nightclub in October of 2002 that killed 202 people. Of course, that group was active for many years uh, in Indonesia with its uh, antecedent of Darul Islam. Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which in October 2004 declared a formal allegiance to bin Laden. AQIM, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb in Algeria, which in September 6, uh, September 2006 became a second formal AQ affiliate. AQAP, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which was reinvigorated by a February 2006 prison break in Yemen. In January of 2009, it declared a formal allegiance to Al-Qaeda Corps, so they're starting to rack up. Al-Shabaab al in Somalia declared support for Al-Qaeda's core agenda in February 2010. And then finally, amidst all this activity, Al-Qaeda core in Pakistan grew increasingly close to a syndicate of militant and criminal groups operating in western Pakistan and in eastern Afghanistan. <coughs> so what are we to make of this rise of affiliates, this association? Well, first I'd offer a caveat, one thing that we've been very careful about is that though we term this as Al-Qaeda and associated movements, there is tremendous diversity across this group. Many of the groups disagree over who the primary enemy is, strategic direction, the practice of excommunication or takfir, um, and a range of other issues. No two alliances between a core, the core and the affiliates, or between individuals and the core are the same. And Al-Qaeda cores rarely exercise strict operational control over these affiliates. And that's why we term bin Laden as inciter-in-chief rather than a commander-in-chief, someone who's been able to inspire, to maneuver groups at the, uh, at the margins and, and do a number of influential activities. But still one common and increasingly important theme across these alliances shows up over time, and that is they grow increasingly focused on Western targets while still having local targets. This is something that the great Norwegian um, uh, Al-Qaeda specialist Thomas Heghammer calls ideological hybridization, and this is when you co-opt a group's local agenda and add on the patna or even a, a, a thicker layer of Al-Qaeda's global jihad of this assault by the West on, on, uh, on Islam. A good example of this would be AQIM with its attack on UN headquarters in Algiers in 2007. Though they have very specific local goals, they've also engaged in a larger attack. Finally, over the past few years, we've seen this rise in small cells and individuals, particularly in the U.S. and Europe, 
recent cases that I think we're all aware of, Najibul Azazi, who was uh, stopped from doing the New York City subway attack, Major Nidal Hassan of the Fort Hood attack, Faisal Shahzad from Times Square. And I would like to reinforce here that all these individuals have varying degrees of connection to al-Qaeda. That's why we put them in the, in the third tier. They do not have regular connections. They may have come in contact with facilitators, with trainers, uh, with, a, with two layers of separation, but there is some layer of, um, of uh, connection there. Lastly, and definitely not least, is the Internet, something that Arnold de Borgrave is a, is a leading thinker on, who did reports on this back in the 1990s on the power of the Internet for cyber terrorism and whatnot is that the indispensability of the Internet has been a tremendous multiplier for this uh, um, movement of groups. Whether you're talking about moving money, whether you're talking about looking for improved tactics, techniques, and procedures, looking at footage of how to conduct an IED attack, going to chat rooms for radicalization, figuring out uh, safe routes into Iraq and Afghanistan, this has been the all-purpose tool for these groups. And it is the biggest safe harbor, the biggest un- um, uh, ungoverned territory for this threat, and it's uh, tremendously important. So if I could give you, in summary, some takeaways from this. AQ Corps being degraded following 9-11, but with this rise of formal and informal affiliates, individuals around the world who have bought into this call to battle, this narrative. They, develop, they illustrate just how difficult uh, and intractable this threat is when you have so many different individuals. It's a flatter organization, decentralized, yet with some common themes and ideology that runs through them. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Ozzy Nelson. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Uh, again, it's important to um, to emphasize on this report that this is the the baseline assessment, as we call it. This is the standard of where we think this threat is today, uh, and the crux of our research is going to be with the release of the the futures portion of this in September. Um, so Tom covered, you know, in a very brief, uh, succinct manner, the evolution of the threat. It's important to understand that. What we're going to focus on today are some of the um, ideas going forward about um, uh, the future of this threat and what it means in, in the near term. Um, we talk about the decentralization of the threat. And again, as Juan and Arnaud noted, this isn't a new concept. You know, clearly bin Laden and Zawahiri called al-Qaeda the base for a reason. It was never meant to be the movement. It was meant to be the base of the movement. And in 2004, Tom and I and, and our colleagues wrote 25 pages. Um, uh, al-Suri, Abu Musabu al-Suri wrote 1,600 pages in 2004 about the importance of a decentralized movement. What he noted uh, was that uh, Islamic, Islamist extremist groups in the past had failed because they were too hierarchical in their approach. And for them to be successful and withstand uh, the test of time and counterterrorism operations, it needed to be a more decentralized movement. Certainly not giving credit to, to al-Suri for this, but certainly his message resonates with, with, with what's currently underway here. So what I think that we've seen, what we think that we've seen in, 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 in some, is basically a transition from al-Qaeda being a hierarchical organization, an organizational structure that was required to jumpstart the movement, to one where the ideology, the al-Qaeda brand, has become more effective and has become a self-sustaining uh, uh, self -sustaining, uh, effort. Uh, and that's critically important because it determines and impacts how you're going to do counterterrorism operations, how you're going to address this threat. Um, but that's something our future uh, analysis, analysis will address. The important thing to know on this decentralized movement, and it is a diverse set of subcomponents. No one is saying this is a coherent movement. But what we are suggesting is this ideology serves as a common uh, linkage between these groups with disparate um, goals, sometimes very regional goals. Uh, and that ideology and that brand, that brand, the U.S., uh, that al-Qaeda brand, and the, the narrative that the U.S. is and West is at war with Islam is not a sound bite. Um, it's like any other, there's a reason why in the United States we protect property rights so dearly that brand has value, and the Al-Qaeda brand has value to these individuals and has value to these groups. The current threat for Al -Qaeda, from Al-Qaeda core going forward, as Tom articulated, certainly Al-Qaeda core is the, is the brand. They are the keepers of the brand um, and the ideology. 
Um, they've been very limited, as Tom pointed out, in their ability to conduct operations, but make no mistake about it, they are still in, in, uh, intent on attacking the U.S., intent on attacking the West, and given the opportunity, they would uh, we would repeat 9-11 uh, on, on any scale they possibly could do. Um, with that said, I think you see bin Laden, and uh, Tom and I, I think you see bin Laden and Zawahiri more in, uh, in symbolic terms right now than you do in leadership terms. Um, the question is always asked, what is the importance of bin Laden and Zawahiri? Um, it's personally, I believe, that you, uh, capturing, killing, or bringing to justice bin Laden and Zawahiri will not bring about the end of the al-Qaeda movement, but you can't begin to bring about the end of the al-Qaeda movement without bringing those two individuals to, to justice. Um, the, the groups that are, are most troubling of our, of our, of our three-pronged model here is the affiliated movements um, and, 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 and the inspired. We broke the affiliated uh, uh, and like-minded groups down into, into evaluation into three basic uh, categories. Um, one is uh, the groups, uh, we looked at the, the capabilities and attentions. As far as capabilities are concerned, it's the ability for these groups, capability of these groups to attack Western targets, their ability to inspire, uh, to plot in support of AQAM's agenda, and its capacity to destabilize a particular region. And the regional issues is something that uh, can't be over overstated. And intentions is determined about how a group is allocating its finite resources. Clearly, all of these groups are intent on destabilizing regions and attacking the West and the United States and the apostate regimes. That, that, there's no mistake about that. But it's how they're allocating, um, in many ways, their precious resources and achieving their goals. Um, when we talk about, as Tom talked about it, when we talk about the relatively small groups, we're talking about um, those that possess uh, neither the capability nor actually the intention to strike Western targets or destabilize a region. Under that rubric, we talk, we're talking about groups such as uh, ETIM, the East Tur Tur Turkestan Islamic Movement, um, a small group, but a noteworthy group and one's being tracked um, by multiple analysts. But at the end of the day, they don't lack the resources or the capability to destabilize the region or to, uh, uh, to attack the West. The next group um, that we're talking about are the groups um, such as AQIM and the Islamic Jihad Unit, IJU. Um, they would like to attack the West, but they lack the capability. Um, but they will continue to pursue the capability, and that's one of the narratives we're going to talk about moving forward with Al-Qaeda and the Al-Qaeda brand is how they can co-op that brand in order to get the capabilities that they need to achieve their goals, regional or global. The most dangerous groups of this subset of the affiliates and like-minded groups are the ones that Tom mentioned, such as AQI, LET, and AQAP. Um, they have the intentions, clearly. They have the resources. And as we've seen in the last year and a half, they certainly have the capability to, to come against us at various degrees. We look at a group such as Al-Qaeda in Iraq, um, which um, it certainly is, has limited in, intentions on attacking the United States, but certainly can undermine the United States in Iraq, where our troops and our, our diplomats are stationed. It certainly can undermine the region um, and destabilize Iraq, um, and to, to some degree even to, to parts of Iran uh, and the rest of the peninsula, if um, the Arabian Peninsula, if they so chose. Um, you look at LET. LET, we did not say this in our report, but personally I believe is one of the most dangerous, if not the most dangerous group, terrorist group in the world, in that it can destabilize a region and possibly bring, a, a, in the worst case, it, a nuclear uh, exchange uh, because of its, um, of its uh, position and situation there. And then uh, when you look at El Shabaab, El Shabaab has, has, has very effective cruising methods underway inside the United States. Arguably, no other group, terrorist group, uh, Al Qaeda affiliate, has the ability to reach into the United States and recruit individuals like El Shabaab can and does. And then, obviously, the group that has received the most publicity of recent is Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, where they continue um, to take their agenda globally. Um, to attack the United States, to attack Europe um, for, for multiple reasons, which we, we cover in the, in, in, in the, in the threat. Um, and then the last, uh, the last part of our tier going forward is, is arguably the most dangerous, and this is one of the things we're going to look, look at going forward, and that is the non-affiliated cells and individuals. Um, and Tom talked about who those are and, and how their varying levels of affiliation. 
But what's challenging about these individuals is they're so difficult and so hard to track. They're so, you know, as we saw with anyone who takes an extremist bent, um, such as in Arizona, it's very difficult to determine when an individual, you know, especially in the United States, who regard free speech so, so, so clearly, when an individual evolves from rhetoric, free speech, to violent action. And that's an extremely difficult thing to, 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 to address, and it's an extremely difficult thing for the law enforcement community to take on. So laying that out, going forward, what are the dynamics for al-Qaeda uh, and the affiliate movements as a broader movement? Um, there has been a lot of talk about the support for bin Laden decreasing over the years. Um, a lot of that has been uh, grounded in the fact that the majority, uh, about 90 percent of al-Qaeda's casualties, uh, um, the casualties they've inflicted, have been other Muslims. Um, and that has begun to erode. As we see with e Egypt, one of the positions that I put forward is that, you know, one of the interesting um, things about Egypt is that the, the people of Egypt were able to achieve um, uh, what al-Qaeda couldn't, which is bringing about the end of, a, of an, what al-Qaeda considered an apostate regime. Whether that's true or not, it, we'll see as it unfolds, but certainly has to give, uh, I think, uh, al-Qaeda al some pause. Um, but going forward, um, why the groups, the, the, the affiliation or the desire to be affiliated with al-Qaeda still remains strong. Uh, in fact, if you look at the, some of the charts we have in the, in the research here, um, you'll see that when, you, when polling data demonstrates from 2000, two, 2006 to 2008 that the al-Qaeda goals, the elimination of the apostate regimes, the elimination of U.S. military presence in the Islamic countries, um, the U.S. support for Israel. When you look at this polling data, the countries where al-Qaeda is targeting, that message still resonates. In fact, the greatest support of the countries in the polling data for al-Qaeda's message actually comes out of Egypt, where you're seeing 60 and 70 percent support for some of al-Qaeda's goals. So while the movement, and now bin Laden may be, bin Laden may have be less popular, and declining, there still is a growing amount of support for the al-Qaeda narrative uh, that the U.S. and the West is at war with Islam. And in fact, you're seeing a growing number of groups affiliate itself with al-Qaeda, um, not a decrease. So while the popular support might be coming down, the actual number of groups that are, are co-opting or buying into the al-Qaeda narrative for whatever its reasons, whether it's achieve its regional goals or, um, or whatnot, is certainly on the, on the increase. Um, so why are they doing this? Why are groups joining al-Qaeda um, and continue to be affiliated with al-Qaeda more appropriately? Um, it's obviously there's the pragmatic reasons that, that we mentioned is the branding. By, by calling yourself part of al-Qaeda, you get instant um, validation. You can now begin recruiting more effectively. You can get resources, um, all of those things that any group that's, that's inspired to be more regionally effective or even globally effective um, would need. But it's also the issue... Um, People are buying into the narrative that the U.S. and the West is at war with Islam. And that narrative, I call it, we call it al-Qaeda's stock narrative, continues to resonate um, throughout the, uh, the, the Muslim communities to embrace this radical and perverted form of Islam, um, and it continues to drive, drive how, they're, how they're going. Now, all of this is under the, under the context of, of, the, of the Internet. And, and I always joke, and you can't say the Internet with this big hand wave. If you don't know, to the older generation in the room, if you don't know what Web 2.0 is and you don't know what um, uh, you know, social media is or, or user-driven content is, I encourage you to go and do some research on it um, because it's changing rapidly, more rapidly, and, and, and again, than our policies and our laws can keep up with. And what the Internet is going to, to mean going forward is it, you know, unlike 20, 30, 40 years ago, and I'll let Arno attest to this, but uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, if you had an extremist group and you wanted to collaborate, you would have to meet in person. You would meet in a safe house. If you wanted to radicalize someone, you would have to bring them to a group meeting or to a mosque or to a church, wherever you wanted that radicalization to take place. You would have to train them and bring them to camps. And while we still see that with al-Qaeda uh, and its affiliated movements, what you're seeing is a growing ability for them to use the Internet to, to have you know, under the entire radicalization process. So now an individual who's disenfranchised for whatever reason, whether it's uh, issues with U.S. actions in Muslim countries in Afghanistan or you're just unhappy because you don't have a job, now you can venue shop and you can go to the Internet. You can involve yourself in, in chat rooms. You can, be, you can go through the radicalization process. You can receive training. You can receive funding. 
you can receive operational guidance, and you can receive your orders to execute all virtually without ever having to meet those that radicalized or recruited you. And that's one of the reasons why individuals such as uh, Anwar al and uh, Hamami are so critically important to this process. They are the ones that are getting these individuals to cross those lines from, vi from rhetoric, from free speech to violent action. And I think that that's what's going to fuel these affiliated movements going forward and is certainly going to fuel these individuals that are inspired towards uh, this extremist bent. So just to summarize before we go into to, to questions and answers, uh, you know, the main takeaways from, from, where, from where we are on this study, and I'd also like to point out as we move forward with the study, we'll have a web page dedicated to this project online, which we'd encourage you to go to, is that the threats emanating from AQAM, um, its constituent parts are highly varied in, uh, in severity and impact. Uh, the movement is expanding and diversifying. Despite signs of eroding legitimacy among former supporters, influential religious figures, and Muslim public writ large, the ongoing resonance of uh, al-Qaeda's core grievances, the negative impact of certain Western uh, policies and counterterrorism activities, and the benefits as associated with being um, associated with al-Qaeda um, still drive the trend for al-Qaeda uh, al associate movements to increase. And then lastly, the Internet, um, as I just stated, is expanding their ability to do this very rapidly and very, very quickly um, and allows this movement to continue to be uh, a, a very, uh, a very dangerous towards us. So how do we describe this movement going forward? As, as Juan pointed out, this is a movement that's in change. Um, we're not, you know, ringing alarm bells per se, but what we're saying is this movement is changing and it's changing very rapidly. Uh, and it's going to be imperative that uh, U.S., Western, and international counterterrorism policies evolve as the threat is evolving. Um, and that's what we're hoping to uncover some ways forward in the future components of this study. So thank you for all coming. We appreciate your time. Tom, Ozzie, thank you for a great summary. Uh, let me just, before we start the Q&A, just say, for those who, who wonder what the threat looks like in real terms, you just need to look to the end of 2010. Uh, the Europe plot, the Mumbai-style attacks that we were all warned about, driven by al-Qaeda core. The package plots, uh, driven by al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, the various homegrown threats, Portland, D.C. Metro, Maryland Recruitment Center, the lone wolf, unaffiliated cells. And then within the context of a homegrowns, uh, you've got the Zazi case, driven by al-Qaeda core, the Shazad case, driven by Pakistan Taliban, uh, and then the assortment of other individuals that we've seen over the last year, year and a half. And so uh, this is not theoretical, it's real, uh, and we've seen the, the manifestation of it in very real ways, I think, over the last few months. So with that, let's take some questions. Richard. We've got microphones. And I ask, uh, first of all, obviously, ask a question, but identify yourself first, please. Uh, this is being uh, taped and will be online afterward. Hi, Ron Marks of various organizations. Uh, actually, for you guys, sort of in general, um, there's a lot of foot stomping that goes with this in the sense of they're on the net. Uh, there are many, you know, they're putting messages out. There are people who are agreeing, et cetera. There have been any number of attacks, and that seems to be increasing as time goes along. I guess the question I would ask in terms of a longer-term strategy for them. What are, they, what are they looking to do? I mean, we see Egypt at this point. It is a group of people who are in the streets who are pushing something democratic. It's a huge nation being changed. What exactly do they think they're doing at this point outside of, and I don't wish to dismiss the threat, but either aggravating or otherwise pushing us to spend more money on, on counterterrorism? What, what do we see as sort of next steps? Or what are they look, are, are they looking to ramp up? Is this just a harassment operation? Or is this something that they're they're looking for beyond the you know the caliphate of the world? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll make an initial statement on that, and then I think uh, Juan wants to jump in. It, of course, I, and I know you know this wrong from your long uh, experience in the intelligence community, but there are so many goals out there. There are some that are focused uh, locally, some that are clearly looking at a regional um, uh, effort to establish a regional caliphate. Think about Jamaa Islamiyah. <laughs> to those that want to survive and those that are involved in more sectarian-oriented conflicts like AQI in, uh, in Iraq. So the goals are varied, and, and I think that you know, s some of them are clearly focused on continuing those battles, some who want to ascend to a new level and, um, and disrupt those at home who they believe are um, apostate, 
corrupt, venal leaders uh, supported by Western leaders. I, I think what's going on in, uh, in Egypt right now is a very tricky um, uh, moment for us where we appear to be dragging our feet a little bit and which strengthens the narrative. And I, I find that very troubling. Uh, that's getting a bit outside your question. But th the range of goals is, is really quite wide. And I think it ranges from mere survival to really ambitious goals of vanquishing Muslim and Arab lands of the, the leadership that they feel is illegitimate. If I can just really quickly, Ron, um, I think we always have to keep in mind that if you think about the Al-Qaeda core itself and the strategists behind it, the Saudis and the Egyptians behind it, they've got the long-term goal in mind. And their long-term goal doesn't shift all that much. What's interesting about the current environment, I think, is they are trying to assess the environment themselves and trying to figure out how they can leverage it. And I think that's what's been interesting over the last year and a half from my perspective is watching how they um, have moved some of their rhetoric both at the local level and strategically to a baiting and bleeding model. That is to say, they, they want to bait and bleed. You've seen that with Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, talking about Operation Hemorrhage. I mean, this is really an attrition model. The other, the other element is whether or not a disruption versus destruction model uh, actually becomes part of their strategic impetus. Uh, and I think that, that may be right, seeing how we've overreacted in some cases to the failed attacks over the last year and a half. Uh, and I think generally you've seen this from Anwar al Awlaki and the American-minded elements of the Al-Qaeda network, AQAM, the notion of inspiring broadly, giving broad credence not only to the narrative but also um, giving justification broadly to the attack of fellow citizens, I think is an attempt to, to cast the net widely to see who takes the bait and who will attack. I think I think Juan's point at the end there is is crucially important. And I don't want to give Al Qaeda too much credit for this, but it is a dynamic that's worth exploring. Is they have to perpetuate the ideology to keep the movement going. And so while the individual inside the United States who gets recruited may not be recruited because he wants to see the establishment of Islamic Caliphate. It may just be because he's disenfranchised about whatever it may be. But if they can get him to take action under the al-Qaeda rubric, the ideology, it serves to perpetuate the ideology. The actions of one will get multiple media attention. It will serve as someone who's inspired by al-Qaeda. And the movement continues on for those that are actually the keepers of the core ideology, which goes back you know, hundreds of years, arguably, um, um, that Juan touched upon. And the affiliates with their regional grievances, like Tom said, there are many. Um, whether it's in, in Somalia or uh, Yemen, they have really regional goals. But then they're stronger working together than they are working individually. And again, they're all stronger by keeping the movement uh, in the public eye and getting people to continue to join it. Next question. Let's go in the middle here, and then Suzanne, you'll be next. Ma'am. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I'm Diane Perlman at the Center of uh, the Institute for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason. Um, anyway, in, before the, um, in 2001, 2003, I was at the um, Center for Study of Ethnopolitical Conflict at, at Penn, and we were all predicting that this would happen. And for people who study conflict dynamics and analysis, that this is all predictable. And a lot of the strategies, I'm not saying that these don't have a part, but we're dealing more with the symptom and then the cause and looking at um, you know some of the just grievances or moral outrage <coughs> or the kinds of policies that might um, support recruitment. So um, does your, is there any way um, that you're considering um, some of these issues, some of them like Bob Pape talks about in um, Dying to Win, about occupation, um, having bases in Muslim countries that uh, support this? I think absolutely. I think we have to because I think uh, our policies impact the, the environment uh, in some ways, feed the narrative, and I think you, you have to be conscious of it. I think the, the balance, at least speaking as a former policymaker, the balance is how do you not provide the enemy a heckler's veto over what may be necessary national security policy while also being sensitive to the fact that, as you described, uh, there are underlying grievances that may be uh, driving some of the dimensions of this movement. And so absolutely, as we look, as we try to project into the future, one of the things that we're looking at, especially in this next stage of the project, is how have our policies actually not only impacted the environment, but maybe influenced it in a way that has allowed it to morph in certain di distinct ways in different geographic areas. 
Uh, and I think looking at, at how this movement evolves in, in terms of the internet and in terms of social movements and the, the fluidity of that, I think we have to be extremely conscious of how policies impact that. Uh, and frankly, you know, one of the arguments I've made is, you know, one of the tricks for the United States is how we extract ourselves from this narrative. You know, how do you, how do you actually extract yourself even though Al-Qaeda is purposely drawing us in, the sort of the baiting idea? And I think that's one of the challenges because I think one of the long-term goals is to take ourselves out of it while remaining a key protagonist in many ways. And that's a fine balance. And again, this is what we're going to explore going forward. But, but the idea that you'll be able to eliminate all of these underlying grievances is just, is just not going to happen. Um, there will always be grievances, and, and, and at some level, the deal, the issue is how do you mitigate those? How do you mitigate your actions and actions in the international community? How do you mitigate the threat that those that are uh, intent on exploiting those grievances from 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 killing? Uh, innocent people. That's that's what you're ultimately trying to do is, is mitigating the, the, the effect of that threat. Uh, and I think that one again is right on the veto issue. We talk about this a lot. Um, is that just you know they, part of the stock narrative is talk about are there larger numbers of U.S. troops in Muslims lands before or after September 11th? There are larger numbers after September 11th. That's no way it should dictate again U.S. foreign policy. What it simply says is that we need to need to be very careful to consider the effects of our actions going forward. And again, we're going to look at that um, during our field research to figure out uh, how we maybe best do that. Uh, if I could add that grievances are not mandatory, uh, just think of the case of a garage owner in Minneapolis whose son is, uh, has finished uh, university. Uh, he can't find a job. And he's online, and he reads uh, the magazine uh, Inspa, the Al-Qaeda magazine online all sorts of exciting prospects in Somalia and Yemen. And here you are at the age of 21, 22, bored with your life, unable to find a job. Those people can be recruited and are being recruited. Thank you very much, Catherine Herridge, Fox News. I have actually three quick questions, if, if that's possible, because <laughs> it's so rare to have you all together. Um, how would you characterize the contacts between AQAP and Al-Qaeda Corps? What do you make of the fact that Americans uh, increasingly have risen through the ranks to become operational, take on operational roles, roles like Alaki? And do you believe the attack in Uganda was the red flag or the signal that Al-Shabaab is no longer regional but going global? Um, the interesting thing about AQAP, which you hear from certain U.S. government experts as being the, the leading threat to the homeland, uh, given their intense focus on attacking the homeland. The interesting thing to me is you have the deep historical ties between the leadership of AQAP, uh, Waishi, for example, a longtime bin Laden ally, uh, who, who has in some ways the global jihadi DNA embedded in him and his forecasting, combined with the innovation of Samir Khan, and Anwar al Americans uh, that actually makes, I think, AQAP quite potent uh, because it makes them both uh, part of the core uh, in a sense uh, ideologically, but also very much adaptive. And that's why I think you've seen some of the innovations in the movement come primarily out of Yemen. It's this group. Uh, and I don't think, as Ozzy said earlier, I don't think um, AQ Core, uh, Bin Laden, Zawahiri, or anyone else uh, is actually directing their operations, but they're certainly uh, simpatico with them and uh, are probably very pleased with what's happening. And maybe actually learning from them. The, the AQ uh, plot in Europe may be a demonstration of that in some ways. <laughs> I get number two, Catherine. Um, the, I mean, the, the issue in the United States is very troubling, and as are no mentioned, it's for Europe as well. Um, I, I would encourage you all to see David Cameron's speech from yesterday, because it talks about this issue and the crisis that Europe is, is facing on it. And I think one of the things that um, my takeaway from David Cameron's speech is that he was very frank, is that you have to have a dialogue, you have to have a discussion about this, um, and, and treat it as a fact of what's happening in these communities. Uh, and sometimes it's a very difficult to address this issue because it has the religious backing to it. But at the end of the day, it's, it's an issue that's challenging us and challenging our democracies, and we're going to have to have a conversation regarding it. With that said, there's no doubt 
um, that the recruiting of Americans um, is, is a troubling issue. Um, if you're a U.S. citizen or legal resident, you can travel the world pretty freely. Um, it gives you access, especially if you have, and, and Ben Badurian and I wrote a report about this last April, if you have a duality, um, a cultural duality where you can like, assimilate overseas culture with the language and understanding the local customs there, and then you can come back to the United States um, and assimilate yourself there as well. And for the United States, we, you know, we, we have to have a very you know, serious conversation about what this means for us. We look at the FBI and the law enforcement community and what they struggle with. The law enforcement community traditionally investigate a body, trying to change that over the last 10 years. But again, they're given the task of, of minding free speech in the United States and allowing people the ability to do that, um, and not going back to the days of McCarthyism, right? Um, but at the same time, they have to determine when an individual moves from free speech, from rhetoric, to violent action. And that's extremely difficult to do. And if they don't do it, they get criticized. How come you didn't know this was coming? And it's further compounded by the fact that the individuals that will probably first recognize when someone moves in that direction, as we saw with Arizona and multiple other cases, um, are going to be friends and family members. So how do you create an environment where friends and family members can come forward and want to cooperate with law enforcement uh, uh, individuals to get their friends and family members help? Without putting him in a situation where um, uh, you, you know we're undermining the you know undermining mosques and churches or undermining you know familiar relationships, it's a very challenging um, situation that the FBI is in, and it's something that we're going to have to address going forward because it's going to challenge a lot of our civil liberties and our civil rights. And I don't know what the answers are, but we have to have the conversation in the United States about how much we're willing to give up and have in return for that security because it's such a difficult problem for us. Thanks for that great third question, because it, it, people don't uh, ask that. I've never heard it before, whether the attack in Uganda by al-Shabaab heralds a ex more expeditionary um, um, movement by the group. They operate in the most lethal and non-permissive environment as far as being able to um, get outside and do a lot of things. This is, the, in my mind, the f only fully failed state in the world. And um, to be able to go out and do expeditionary activities, I think, is difficult given the, the security within the area of Somalia. So tough for them to do, but I think this shows that they're able to do it. Um, there's obviously enmity with Christian Ethiopia, and that was one of the reasons that drew some of the diaspora back to Somalia, which actually, I think, points to their future capability. If they are unable to uh, conduct expeditionary attacks within East Africa and the Horn of Africa, then they can potentially draw on the diaspora that's in the United States, Canada, Australia, and other places. So to me, it's a significant concern. And my colleague, Dave Gordon, and I will head to um, the Horn of Africa and East Africa to look uh, into this as, as Ozzy and I and, and Dave and Ben had to do some of this field work. But I, I do think it's uh, something that they would like to do. I think it's very difficult for them to do it. I don't think they have the mobility uh, to do that, but they can potentially tap that diaspora. This, I, I, one more point, Catherine. Sorry, I had a question because I, I to get to it. You know, when you talk about the issue of Hamami and al um, that's a conversation we need to have in the United States. And, and it's not just a conversation. We need to come up with what our policies are and our laws are going to be regarding the, how we're going to address these individuals. Um, you know, al post videos on YouTube. You can go and I can, you can put his name in there and you'll get a gazillion videos. Um, he's a U.S. citizen overseas in Yemen, obviously directly, you know, uh, conspiring to commit terrorist attacks against the United States and has blood on his hands. What are we in the United States going to do about those individuals? We haven't figured that out. After these individuals start conducting attacks and conspiring to conduct attacks, is not the time for us to figure this out because we don't want to address our laws and our policies, I think, in a time of crisis. We want to do it before the crisis happens. So these are some of the questions that I, I hope that uh, the executive branch and Congress continues to address. Let me just add on the question about um, the mosques and uh, the imams and what they're up to. When Sarkozy was Minister of the Interior in France, he ordered a study of the 100 m most important mosques in France. And they discovered that 45% of the imams in charge had no religious education whatsoever. When asked how they were getting material for their Friday sermons, they pointed to uh, Al-Qaeda sites on the internet. They were all pro-Al-Qaeda sites. And that was a long time ago when he commissioned that study. Suzanne, and then we'll go in the corner. Thank you, Suzanne Spaulding with Bingham McCutcheon. 
I'm interested in the movement, uh, hearing a little bit more about the movement from Category 3, the inspired uh, groups, to uh, Category 2, the actual affiliated groups. And I'm thinking of, you know, sort of the notion of Al-Qaeda wannabes. Um, and and I'm, I'm wondering, uh, for example, whether the, our reaction to the failed Christmas Day attempt um, a, a, over a year ago uh, lowered the price of admission, in effect. I mean, the, the fact that that, that, that that was a failed attempt, and yet, uh, I think largely because, and Juan, you alluded to this, our overreaction to a failed attempt, um, within you know, a matter of days or weeks, uh, bin Laden, seeing the political impact, stepped up and claimed credit. Uh, interestingly enough, apparently that claim of credit wasn't covered very broadly by the uh, tr traditional um, terrorist websites because they didn't give it credibility. But whether that, the reaction, the positive reaction, sent a signal to the wannabes around the world that it, that it didn't take quite as much to get that valuable Al-Qaeda brand name. Yeah, I, mean, I think, um, I, this is a great question. I think, you know, exactly, it, it builds the brand. Uh, you know, think about last year when, when the, for the Christmas Day bombing, we shut down government for basically a month. Um, we held hearings, we talked about it in the media, there's a financial cost to that, um, and there's obviously the cost and time and resources of figuring out how to do that. Um, and it, we have to get away from that. We, we really do, and I think we'll explore this going forward, so I don't want to get too far ahead of the study, but we have to weigh what the implications are of that. We have, a, it, it goes back to my earlier comments about um, making policy decisions in advance of the attack, because uh, we still wrestle with the fact in the United States, I think, that taking no action is actually a choice, um, and we wrestle with that, and we have to be very mindful um, going forward that when we do react, we do feed, as Juan have stated earlier, we do feed into that narrative, and, and we, we can't do that. Um, go ahead. The, the one thing I'd say um, is in terms of the categories as, as we've uh, elaborated them, I think one thing to keep in mind is that the current environment, and I think we'll look at this in terms of the future environment, is growing more and more fluid, such that not only do you have a blending of the groups, uh, you know, I call it the witch's brew of terrorist uh, groups, for example, in Western Pakistan, but also the diversity of the operatives. And so you could have the lone wolf type who is inspired on the internet simply trying to blow up the local recruitment center. We've seen cases of that. At the same time, you could have the individual who has cultural connections, as Ozzy was talking about, back into Pakistan, who finds his or her way into a Pakistan Taliban camp, or into an Al-Qaeda camp, or into an ETIM camp. Um, I think one of the striking things to me about the Abdul Muttalib case, the December 25th case, was the fact that you had a Nigerian student who had studied in London who actually found his way into the hands of AQAP, not into the hands of AQ Corps, which would have been the presumption of the foreign fighter pipeline in the past out of London, or into the hands of AQIM, which has contacts and reach into Nigeria. But instead, he finds his way, a Nigerian student out of London, into Yemen. And so I think that speaks to the diversity issue and speaks to Catherine's question earlier about uh, the, the operatives that are out there. I think one of the challenges with a group like Al-Shabaab is it can recruit not just Somali uh, expats who are from the diaspora, but can recruit from other ethnic groups. And I think one of the things you hear from security agencies around the world is they're concerned about not just the blending of the groups, but the diversity of the operatives. And so I think over time you're going to see in these three categories a blending. And so somebody could, by circumstances, end up in that third category. But at the same time, they could, by circumstances, end up in that first category, being deployed by Al-Qaeda Corps because they happen to have been captured uh, and sent as, as part of a plot. And so I think that's going to be part of the, the very complicated environment moving forward. <coughs> Suzanne, your, your question also points to the lowering barriers of entry into the internet, not just that this attack says, hey, anything you can do, the smallest ankle bite is effective, but with internet penetration increasing ever more, then you have a lower barrier of entry to find out how this is working, to be inspired by such a move, and to see the commentary on that, and that just it shows, again, the thread that the internet runs through all this. The corner here, and then to Raymond in the middle. I am Daniel Morrow from SAIS Johns Hopkins. Uh, I happened to be in Kampala last summer, the day that it was bombing. Um, after three weeks, uh, we recovered about 90 or 95 bodies and two extra feet. I went to ask the authorities why they were unable to identify all the people. They said 
we in Uganda don't have the record of the people living in the country. We don't have the record, uh, the official record of the number of the identity of the people living in Uganda. I think uh, the European and the, the, the Western countries could give the money and the, the opportunity to this government at least to know who is living in their country because we tend to do to, to speech of uh, you know, global systems. So, and it's very practical this because uh, they don't know how many Somali, because in this case was uh, inside the Somalian community because mainly were Somali killed by other Somalis. The second uh, is a question for the journalist, being me a, a journalist from Italy. I think during the Cold War we did a great job uh, uh, explaining with Radio Free Europe and many BBC and so to the people of the communist bloc what was happening inside it. Why do you think we are not doing enough, uh, because uh, it's clear that we are not doing enough, explaining for you, just to give you an example, why don't we explain to the Egyptian people that 10% of the population one month ago, the Christian Copts, were killed, uh, part of them, by the other Arabs living, Egyptian like them, not American, not uh, Western European, were killed by other Arabs. Why don't we explain better that the Algerian French monks uh, were doing kid carrying in Algeria and they were killed uh, by Al Qaeda? They were killed, doctors taking care of Algerian boys, not. Uh, 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 thank you. Excuse me. The way I would answer that is that. Um, when I started my career 62 years ago, you had 2,500 American foreign correspondents around the world. Today, you have about 250. Um, I don't think that the world has been covered as badly in the print media today in my lifetime. It's the worst that I've ever seen. Uh, I read, uh, obviously, the Financial Times every morning, and I'm just amazed at the amount of important stories in the Financial Times that are have been ignored by our mainstream media, inc including the New York Times and the Washington Post. So, um, and most people, as you know, get their news online these days. You get your quick news fix, uh, but you're not really reading in depth anything because th allegedly you don't have the time anymore. But I think there's uh, that. Uh, was that? I'm sorry. Uh, did I say something? Wasn't. It? <laughs> But I think that is uh, at the root of the problem that you raise. Beyond that, I allow your speculation. I think it's as valid as anybody else's. I think on the, on the first issue, I, I think there are major challenges in countries that have uh, difficulties manning their borders, have refugee populations. I think uh, there's been a lot of effort to try to help countries uh, build capacity to uh, understand flows of individuals in and out, especially suspect individuals. I think that's just a major challenge. It also does speak to the, the reality that there is still a physical dimension to this problem, that al-Qaeda and its affiliates, especially its most le least lethal affiliates, uh, have taken full advantage of the physical and geographic safe havens around the world, the seams in the world that offer them opportunities to interact, collaborate, and train. And so that's why Somalia, Yemen, uh, the Sahel, uh, Western Pakistan uh, are so important in the context of the movement, where you see the major elements of the movement, you happen to also have physical safe haven that's enabled then by the internet and other factors. And so I think building capacity to understand flows of, of individual suspects, individuals, incredibly important. And I would commend to you, as, uh, since you're an Italian journalist, uh, to take up the issue of passenger name rec records, which is now uh, in dispute between the U.S. and the EU. And I think incredibly important to maintain uh, the flow of that information and the connectivity of that information between U.S. and Europe. Without it, we're blind. And I think there have been some naysayers in Brussels who don't quite see the value of it. Uh, and I think that's dangerous. Raymond? Right here in the middle. Uh, Arnold, you, you made very uh, interesting comments on the Muslim Brotherhood. On I'd what? like to on ask the, uh, yeah. the rest, uh, Juan, Rick, and Tom, uh, whether they, uh, 
would want to share their thoughts on the Muslim Brotherhood and the kind of role that they might play in Egypt in the context of what's happening today in, in that country. And also in the context of the study, um, what kind of links exist, you know, be exist between uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and AQAM and um, whether uh, there is any place uh, in, in the study that we're doing today you know, in, on this subject to, to also uh, spend a bit of time to focus on the Muslim Brotherhood in, in light of uh, its increasing prominence in, in uh, politics in Egypt and the region. Thank you. Uh, I'll just, um, Raymond, thank you again for that, for that question. I'll, before we talk about the Muslim brother per se, I, I think it's important to note, um, be careful what you ask for, you just might get it when it comes to, you know, the democracies in, in Egypt uh, or anywhere else. We look at, because um, we want, the United States wants democracies globally, which we should have. But democracies are going to do what they would need to do. They're not always going to do what's in the best of U.S. national security interests. So you look at uh, the example of Turkey from 2003 when we wanted Turkey's support to go into northern Iraq and the parliament voted no. It wouldn't let us go into that. So on one hand, we're excited to see an Arab, you know, a Muslim democracy, sorry, Muslim democracy um, uh, like that, uh, a democracy in a predominantly Muslim country make that decision at the same time it wasn't in U.S. national interest. So I think in Egypt, um, before you talk about the Muslim Brotherhood, if we go to a pure democracy in Egypt, then the dynamics that happen underway there may not be favorable to U.S. national security interests or even to international community interests. But at the same time, we have to support the democracy and let the democratic process take place. Uh, Ray, uh, MB has been a thorn in uh, that country's side for a long, long time, and I'm afraid it's going to be now a thorn in everybody's side throughout the Middle East. I mentioned a moment ago the uh, very close links they have with Hamas and Hezbollah. Uh, this is a sort of Hezbollah of Egypt. Uh, they have uh, been brilliant with their camouflage uh, as they increase their popularity. It's now about 25% of the electorate, but that doesn't impress me because uh, they are extremely well organized. Raymond, you, you'd ask for my opinion. I'll, I'll give you just very quick. I think people take solace in the fact that uh, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, uh, different from, from the other uh, branches, but still linked to groups like Hamas, et cetera, uh, has disavowed violence, um, has appeared to be more progressive, um, has come under fire from al-Qaeda and Zawahiri, for example. Uh, but I think Arnaud is right in um, sort of issuing a, a word of caution here because uh, it's not clear what the Muslim Brotherhood's intentions are. I think we also forget that the Muslim Brotherhood is still fractured in some ways, and so it's not yet clear where it heads as an organized political movement in an open environment. And third, it's not clear how these social movements, as we're seeing them now in the 21st century, evolve, especially leaderless movements that uh, are defined by uh, mo what appear to be moderate street protests, but may, at the end of the day, be co-opted by organized, more radical groups. And so. I think we need to be cautious here because I, I don't think we quite understand how the Muslim Brotherhood is going to take advantage of the environment and what elements of the Muslim Brotherhood will take advantage. I think, you know, the most immediate dimension of that is what happens then in terms of Gaza uh, because you have the clear links and the allegiances to Hamas. Uh, does the Rafah border uh, open suddenly for the movement of arms, missiles, and, and cash? Uh, and so I think that becomes a, a, a tactical um, immediate question as part of the broader strategic uh, question that you rightly raised. What, one final comment on that is what, what we know about the Muslim Brotherhood and other groups similar to that is in the context of what they believe is a permanent state of affairs with Mubarak in power. Now that that appears to be no longer the case, uh, all bets are off potentially. And so we have to consider that there now may be a change given that there's an opportunity. Let me just make one final comment. It, this, this points to the diversity and importance of the group that we've assembled, the group of experts. Uh, sitting on our group of experts is Scott Atran, uh, so someone I respect immensely, an anthropologist, a friend of mine. Uh, he came out with a New York Times piece that actually runs exactly counter to what we just said. Uh, he entitled it the, the Bumbling Brotherhood and talked about not overestimating uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. And so um, I think on our, on our board, we have a great diversity of views, which will uh, add to the richness of our project and studies. Let's go over there, sir. Yes. Uh, Dominic Gerpoli, uh, the Stimson Center. Um, 
I had a question regarding uh, this, sort of, this sort of a web or Al Qaeda 2.0 and this internet generation. And um, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on uh, Dr. John Horgan at International Center for Study Terrorism talked about, you know, there's radicalism and then there's violent radicalism. And there's a big leap between one and the other. Um, and so, you know, you have this chart that says, get the United States to withdraw forces from Islamic countries. And there's huge support for that. And that's an AQA, uh, AQAM goal. Um, that's a pretty general statement. Um, I think you could find most people in the Middle East would agree with that. But that's, there's a big leap from saying, I want the United States to withdraw from Islamic countries and I want to pick up a gun and start shooting U.S. citizens or, or, or planning and plotting. And I was wondering if you could speak to that because, you know, the top three things you have listed here, get the United States to stop supporting Egypt. Um, I would bet that a lot of the protesters right now, many of them non, uh, non-violent would probably say, you know, I'd like you to stop supporting Hosni Mubarak. Um, and so there's a big leap between making that an al-Qaeda goal and someone who is angry over United States support for Hosni Mubarak. Um, so if you could speak to, you know, people that generally agree with ideology or generally ascribe to a lot of these beliefs and people that are willing to actually take that next step. It's a great question. Um, let me take it in, in parts here. Uh, one of the things that Ozzy mentioned was uh, the, uh, the depth of the, the narrative of the West being at war with Islam. And I think one of the strategic innovations of al-Qaeda in the 90s and post 9-11 has been to, um, to piggyback onto that narrative. Al-Qaeda's narrative is, a, is an adjunct to that broader narrative. Um, I heard Prime Minister Blair speaking to Charlie Rose, and he said one of the things that he would wish he had understood more of now that, he, now that he's out of government, he wished he had understood more of when he was prime minister, was the depth of that sense, the depth of that narrative of the West being at war with Islam. That said, you're right. That's a different narrative from al-Qaeda's narrative of the violent jihad and of, of facing the, uh, the West as the, the primary enemy, the, the head of the snake, which is the second innovation from al-Qaeda uh, in terms of driving the, uh, the jihadi uh, narrative and also energies toward attacking the United States. So um, I, I think in that divide is that question of where is it that we should be worried? Is it in the context of uh, more radical opposition to U.S. presence and interests, or is it simply in the violent manifestations of this in an organized way? And I think the, that question is one of the fundamental questions that I think governments have been grappling with since 9-11. You look at the debate in the UK with respect to their prevent program, their counter-radicalization program. The key issue for them is, uh, are we most worried about uh, radicalization that is, in essence, in opposition to Western values, to Cameron's speech uh, just the other day? Or is it just merely the, the violent manifestations of it? And so can, can we, for example, partner with Salafi voices, credible Salafi voices, to actually oppose the al-Qaeda narrative, even though those voices are in direct opposition to a democratic, pluralistic uh, Western ethos? Um, and I think, I think you have to explore that dimension, in part because radicalization now is so fluid. I think there are rings of radicalization which, which can bring people who are marginally radicalized into the violent sphere very quickly. Uh, and I think that debate is one that has to be had all the time and has to be calibrated. But I don't think you can divorce, frankly, the, the radical ideologies that are anti-Western from uh, then the violent manifestations of it, because I think the twain meet uh, over and over again in very uh, dangerous ways. Let's go here. No, Catherine, you had your chance. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
and uh, going into southern Thailand. So JI has always been the 800-pound gorilla in Southeast Asia, very significant with links to al-Qaeda, with uh, individuals who fought in Afghanistan alongside uh, al-Qaeda members. But they took a significant hit with the Bali attacks. That was seen as tremendously un-Indonesian. Uh, they took a, a big hit for that and essentially went to ground. Now, at the same time, the Australians, primarily in the United States, came in uh, to Indonesia and worked closely with the Indonesians to improve law enforcement, uh, investigatory practices, um, judicial practices, and, and helped the Indonesians become a real standout in counterterrorism. Um, and so what the what JI has done is engaged in outreach, DAKWA, and um, continues to operate at schools, continues to have a vision of uh, a caliphate, the vision out to 2025, uh, ironically, with the same year we're looking at. But they've also sent fighters to other places, non-structural JI, some of these fighters are referred to, where they've gone to Mindanao to fight with the more Islamic Liberation Front, some who've ended up with Abu Sayyaf group. <coughs> Excuse me. They have uh, knocked on the door of the uh, ethnic uh, insurgency in southern Thailand with the Malays and offered assistance there, which was spurned, I should say. So they're a significant threat. They remain a threat. There's been recent activity in Aceh with uh, a, a number of individuals there, hundreds, in fact, who are, are um, causing great concern. They are significant. They are beaten down to a degree. They have lost Norden Top. They've lost Dulmatan. A number of figures, as you point out, have been killed or captured, and that's great. And the Singaporeans have been great partners in that, but no way are they finished. And I think they remain, uh, remain a potential problem. If, if I could just add one point on this from a, a former policymaker standpoint, I think um, Southeast Asia and the, the threats there and how they've morphed uh, presents a very interesting case study as to uh, how governments have successfully collaborated uh, to constrain the reach of a problem. If folks look back and think back to the post 9-11 period, uh, the idea of um, a second front in the war on terror was largely focused on Southeast Asia. I mean, a lot of the journal articles, a lot of the focus, with good reason. Um, but with good reason, we, don't, we no longer talk about Southeast Asia in those terms. I think in large part because of the work of the governments in the region, uh, Singaporean government's a good example, the Indonesians have uh, been very good at doing the hard things in terms of counterterrorism work, but then also the soft things, uh, like rehabilitation programs, et cetera. Uh, much of it enabled by the Australians and the Americans. And so I think, as we look at these studies and, and look at how governments have been able to infect, affect the environment of the threat, uh, Southeast Asia actually becomes a very interesting and important model that I think not enough people have looked to uh, to see what a successful model actually uh, looks like. Thanks, Juan. One, one more thing on Southeast Asia. One of the reasons we went there was to show that there's real there are real differences between what's happening there. There are ethno-nationalist insurgencies like the MILF in Mindanao, the, uh, more, uh, the ethnic Malays in southern Thailand who are fighting local battles against what they see as oppressive governments. Then you have groups that are tied to al-Qaeda. You have groups that are hybrid criminal extremist groups like Abu Sayyaf group. <clears throat> so it's very important that we don't take a blunt one-size-fits-all approach to Southeast Asia. There's a real range and we do not need to make enemies where we don't need them but we do need to focus on the groups like JI and others that are focused on the United States that have killed Americans and Australians and others who are in Indonesian target our allies down there. So it's important that people don't look at Southeast Asia or any part of the world for that matter as having this monolithic uniform sense that there are Muslims in, in, who are fighting and therefore they're, they're all part of this Al-Qaeda network. No, a lot of them have very focused local goals that um, are open to debate as to legitimacy. Let's go to this side, this young lady standing. Thank you. Uh, Catherine Kai, CSIS. Um, first of all, thank you, Juan and Ozzy, Tom, and Arno. Um, here's my question. With regards to the proliferation of the Internet, um, what steps are being taken or should be taken by law enforcement and intel agencies to identify and prevent these online recruiters and homegrown terrorists? Yeah, I mean, that's a, obviously a great question, something we're going to explore going forward, uh, Kat. Um, again, the issue here is we have to, we, as addressing it and framing the issue, um, our laws and our policies, um, you know, could arguably lag 
behind the evolution of technology. And, you know, the, the technology will be used for good, it'll be used for evil. So there's obviously, a, anytime you impose a law or a, or a policy on top of the internet, this could potentially have a negative impact on, on people that are trying to use it for, for benefit. Um, but we have to ask ourselves that question, you know, if somebody puts something on the internet, um, uh, for example, a video that belongs to Sony Music, it gets taken, taken down immediately because it's a violation of national property rights, right? So the question is, what is our policy, what are the laws regarding, you know, the rhetoric of uh, someone like Anwar Halaki who has, you know, blood on his hands? Um, yes, we have to protect free speech, uh, but at the same time, what, is the limits, what are the limits of that free speech and what should be allowed to be posted on the Internet? I don't have the answer to that question. I'm not recommending, as some have said, that I'm censoring the Internet, but I think that we need to have that, that question. We need to explore it and say what we're going to accept. The same thing with, um, you know, with using uh, the technologies that reside in the United States, the servers, the, the companies, the, it, it's there. What are we going to do? The movement of financial transactions, which Juan knows infinitely better than I do. They're, they're inside the United States for a microsecond, and then they're, they're back out elsewhere. What are our policies going to be regarding that? And I don't think we have it. And I think, again, as we go to the peer-to-peer -peer technologies become and peer-to-peer -peer systems become more prevalent, because, you know, HTTP is, is dead. We're now going to the peer-to-peer -peer applications, which are much more difficult to address. Um, it, it poses some serious challenges regarding laws, international you know, property rights, so privacy. Uh, and I don't think we have our arms around that. Um, and, and we need to address this because we don't want to address it. My concern is, this is a personal opinion, not a result of the study, my concern is there will be a significant ta attack in the United States, um, and the Internet will be too, quote, unquote, be blamed, and then we will have reactionary policies or laws put in place that will have a long-term negative effect. That's not the time when we want to change the laws of the United States as a, as a time of crisis. We need to do that and address those policies in advance. I think we also have to remind ourselves of the size of what we're as was alluded to very briefly, the size of the internet. When John Negroponte was DNI, he asked me if I knew what a petabyte was. I had no idea. He said, well, imagine the entire Library of Congress with its 40 million volumes and 250 million manuscripts and 10,000 new items arriving every day and 535 miles of shelf space. That is 0 0.20 petabytes. And moving through cyberspace every day is several hundred times more than the entire Library of Congress. I think in the end, my, my view on it is the, the Internet is their advantage over ours. Uh, they can engage it in a way and access it in a way that we can't. Our ability to respond to it is slowed down by so many restrictions and uh, with so many weapons and capabilities, they can jump on it and use it, manipulate it, modify it to their use much more quickly than we can. Why don't we go right here to this gentleman? Uh, Steve Rader from SAIC. Uh, two quick questions. Um, one is, uh, AQAM really a Sunni Salafi as opposed to, uh, we tend to label things Islamist, but is it a, a largely a Sunni Salafi movement? Uh, because obviously huge numbers of its victims have been Shia and I think Ahmadi and et cetera. Uh, and I'd like your comments on that. And the other is uh, something we haven't talked about here. Uh, what are the vulnerabilities of AQAM? Now, c clearly what we're, we're dealing with here is the Al-Qaeda-led uh, movement, and so we're talking about the Sunni-led uh, movement. The, some, some call it the Salafi Jihadi movement. So, yes, uh, we're not talking about uh, uh, the Shiite movements, uh, the Revolutionary Guard, uh, or the movements out of Iran, for example. That forms part of the environment and actually is part of something we'll be looking at. But certainly, in terms of the AQAM movement itself, we're talking about the Sunni-derived uh, extremist movement. Well, clearly there are um, inherent challenges for them in, in that there are uh, conflicts around the world with respect to the Shi Shiite uh, populations. You see Iraq, you know, much of the, the program from AQI was defined by its uh, challenges and, and its fight with uh, the Shia. Uh, interestingly, you see in, for example, 2005, the Zawahiri to Zarqawi letter, uh, where Ayman al Zawahiri asks Zarqawi whether or not it's actually the right moment to, be, to begin fighting 
<clears throat> with the Shia and um, asked whether or not that's the strategic right move when, in fact, the, all the energy should be placed on uh, attacking American interests and American presence. Uh, and so you see this, the, the defined space uh, that al-Qaeda operates in is not just viewing the United States as uh, being in opposition, but also view, viewing the broader landscape within Muslim communities, uh, Shia and otherwise, as being enemies. I would also say moderate Sunnis uh, being viewed as uh, takfiri in many ways, uh, becoming uh, the subject of, of targets by al-Qaeda. You see uh, Sufi communities, for example, in Somalia and in Pakistan uh, who, who have become part of the, uh, the target group for al-Qaeda. Um, Strategically moving forward, I think one of the things we'll be looking at is how uh, al-Qaeda's relationship with Iran uh, fits into the broader strategic evolution of AQAM. We've seen um, some footsie being played between the two uh, over time because of the common enemy of the United States. But as we all know, uh, they, uh, they hate each other, uh, and strategically they would uh, prefer to be fighting each other than uh, collaborating. And so how that plays in especially given the potential conflict with Iran, is something we're going to look at as one of the potential shocks and factors moving forward uh, with the movement. Steve, did you have a it, short follow-up? I can't remember. Did, the, the second part was yeah. the vulnerability. Okay. Yeah. The, the um, I, I, you know, on the Z to Z telegram is very interesting because I, I don't I don't recall the exact numbers, but I think one page you know is our cow we spent talking about how evil the United States was, and 15 pages talking about how evil the Shias were. Um, so this is certainly um, certainly something that uh, can be used as a vulnerability, as, as a fissure um, that can be exploited. It, you know, I, I believe personally that an organization or person's greatest strength is also their greatest weakness. So it's the things, the vulnerabilities for Al Qaeda are its strengths. It's, it is, it's dependent on a brand. Many companies have had brands tarnished, um, and getting your brand back is difficult. The United States and the West, we need to undermine that brand. Um, the network, its strength is in its, in its decentralized movements. Networks can be disaggregated. That will have to that will occur. And also a lot of it that feeds into the narrative is U.S. and Western action. And what Juan ta talked about and Tom talked about earlier, we can control our actions and what we do. And again, not suggesting what we should or shouldn't do, but we should just take into account the effect. So there can be a lot, but this is, again, this is what the study is going to explore, so we encourage you to come back in September. Yeah. S Steve, the lack of a positive message in the minds of many people and much of the Muslim community around the world, uh, of which 80 to 85 percent is Sunni, uh, the, the rest predominantly being Shiite. But J.I., Jamal Lamia, points to a good uh, example of a vulnerability is overreach, just as al-Qaeda in Iraq did as well. Too vicious of attacks, uh, beheadings, um, doing things that are seen as, as un-Islamic as, as we saw in Indonesia, where you have two huge um, civic movements uh, that, that um, opined on this, and, and the population in general saying, this is not Indonesian, this is not our brand of Islam, and that is a great, uh, great tool in our hands if we can uh, use it well. I think we'll go with one more question. Bill Gacious. Just curious, Juan uh, and others, about um, your descriptions of core and affiliates. Uh, certainly, they seem to have prospered somewhat in areas of the world where the central government is not totally in control of the territory. Uh, in the past few years, I think you've seen probably an increase in associations between both perhaps core and affiliates with criminal elements. So I take you to Michael Hayden's departure speech from the CIA, in which he labeled the second most dangerous threat to the US is the situation in Mexico. And I'm just curious what you think, because I know this issue's been debated, and will you address in your 2025 paper anywhere the possibility of having to be concerned about affiliates and semi-homegrowns uh, operating, training, surviving in the mess that uh, Mexico is becoming, the third war of America, as I think Fox News says. So, thanks. Yeah, I mean, th this is really a credit to Arnaud and the work that he's done over the years here. Um, you know, Arnaud has looked at the, the role of international organized crime, drug trafficking networks as transnational threats. 
uh, long before others did, including uh, looking at the cyber threat. Um, and so uh, I think one of the things, and we've talked about this, I've lectured on this, that one of the things we're going to have to look at is the blending of the transnational threats and the environment. In a sense, looking beyond al Qaeda as a construct, perhaps, and looking at the stew of bad actors and transnational actors that uh, feed off of each other, use each other's uh, access and platforms, operatives, networks, et cetera, uh, to, then, uh, to then promote either their profit motive or their ideological motive. Um, I think in the context of Mexico, it presents a huge uh, concern, I think, to us from a stability perspective, obviously, the reach of these Mexican uh, cartels, not just into the United States, but into Central America and beyond. And then how those networks then feed into other networks. For example, you look at the drug trafficking networks that have evolved over the last couple of years out of South America in through West Africa and up into Southern Europe. You've seen, for example, DEA-led uh, indictments uh, naming al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb members who are part of those drug trafficking networks that are then tied back to uh, Colombia and Venezuela. Uh, and so I think we've got to look very, very, very much so in the globalized environment we're operating in into the mix of uh, transnational threats and actors. And I think no doubt you have to look at the drug trafficking organizations in this hemisphere as part of that environment. It was, it, go, go ahead, Arno. It was right after 9-11 that we uh, changed the name of uh, Global Organized Crime, which I was running in the 1990s, to transnational threats because of what we'd already spotted as the convergence between the two in uh, Afghanistan with the opium traffic where everybody's getting its share, even the Pakistani ISI, Al-Qaeda, um, Karzai's government, everybody's got his finger in that pie. And uh, it seems to me that this is the future. There'll be more and more examples of a convergence between the two. And this notion is not abstract. I'll give you two actual examples that, uh, interestingly enough, involve Hezbollah, so a Shiite group. Uh, and these were two very successful DEA operations, Operation Mountain Express and, uh, and another one. So in North Carolina, this is post 9-11, you had the Hamoud brothers who were illegally selling uh, cigarette cartons without the ta with a fake tax stamp on them. They were shipping them from the Carolinas up to Massachusetts, Maine, Maryland, and others, and taking the proceeds and buying night vision goggles, laser rangefinders, uh, mine detection equipment, and blasting caps, and sending that back to the Beka Valley. A second example is, uh, again, Hezbollah sympathizers and operators in Canada buying pseudoephedrine tablets, putting them in the tires of uh, trucks that had fake U.S. mail and uh, FedEx stickers on them, driving them to Chicago and Detroit, selling them to meth, uh, Mexican meth gangs who brought them down into America's own ungoverned territory, some of our national parks, where they cooked it up. The proceeds then did the same thing. They purchased equipment, went back through Canada and back to the Bekaa Valley. So that happened in the U.S. And that involved Mexican meth gangs. It involved uh, uh, Lebanese Shiite uh, Hezbollah supporters in the Carolinas and, again, the same group in Canada. So this is quite a network. It's taken place. The DEA nailed these two cases, and uh, they point to the reality that the United States mm -hmm. is part of this uh, terror crime nexus. Yeah, and I would, again, when we talk about safe havens, uh, you know, I, I would encourage uh, us to kind of discard our traditional understanding of what a safe haven is. Um, certainly Somalia is a safe haven, a physical safe haven, but there can be safe havens based on a country's laws, a um, democratic construct. There can be safe havens virtually as such as the Internet. So a safe haven as we move forward is going to, it's going to be in flux, and people are going to exploit, these groups are going to exploit any type of safe haven they can. And I think you're going to see more of this. I think everyone who spoke is correct. You're going to see more of this as we become the United States and the West and the international community become more effective in our counterterrorism and our counterdrug operations that these organizations are going to be forced to, to use each other's resources in order to get it, to get what they need done. With that said, I think it's important, though, to note um, that the cartels have very different goals, clearly, than al-Qaeda has. Um, the cartels are about making money, period. So, you know, they are not going to, dis not going to dis subject their business model to any undue risk. So they will continue to weigh that. So while certainly those, I think those lines are going to be used and something we will explore in our study, we have to keep, into, keep in mind what the ultimate goals of those entities that are sharing resources are all about. I think that'll do it. I uh, want to thank you again for attending. I want to thank uh, the authors for a great report, Arnaud, for hosting. And um, 
We ask that you keep track of the project. As we said, we will have a capstone conference in September uh, to look at the final report, and we look forward to welcoming you then. Thank you. Tom showed you the book that uh, Ron Marks has written, Ron Marks's book. Ron? Nobody here.